Hi, my name is Errol McLean from the University of Wollongong and my co-author on this paper is John Hinwood from Monash University in Victoria. The background image on the title slide is of the Snowy River Estuary in southeastern Australia. We have some history over many years researching mainly hydrodynamic aspects of this estuary. And as the title indicates, this presentation is about our examination of the salinity response to environmental flow releases in different segments of the estuary. While our larger study included tributary lakes and channels for this presentation, we've limited the data to the main trunk channel of the estuary. The main issues for consideration for this paper were the environmental flows or EFRs. And they're usually used to partly restore the ecological and geomorphological function of rivers where the construction of water storages through dams or river diversion has removed some of the natural drainage system. Most EFRs are designed to impact on the upper catchment channel segments where the impacts are clearly observable. The monitoring of the restoration of function is often confined to those segments and often very little attention is paid to the estuarine areas near the mouth of the catchment. This study reports the monitoring of two environmental flows in the Snowy River and the subsequent modelling to identify impacts on the salinity regime of its estuary over a range of pulse flows. The Snowy River is an iconic river in Australia, the subject of poems, stories and film. There's a long indigenous history and a far briefer history of European settlement and is a recognised area of natural beauty. Despite this, it's only relatively recently that much attention has been paid to researching its function in any detail. The Snowy Mountains Hydro Scheme, constructed between 1948 and 1974, excised the upper 15% of the catchment above Genderbine, as shown on the map to the right altering the river regime for the rest of the catchment and the estuary. As well as producing a reduction in the magnitude of natural pulse flows, the spring snowmelt flow was almost completely removed from the main catchment. While some release of the snowy catchment was undertaken, it was piecemeal and far below that required to maintain the river in anywhere near its natural state. Over the last decade or so, an EFR regime has been established by various trial releases uh, including monitoring of the effects of the flows on the river. This regime has been designed primarily to repair the upper channel ecology and to hopefully mollify local concerns about the river degradation. Note on the map of the estuary on the left of the slide, the upper, middle and lower locations mentioned in our modelling is uh, marked in blue lines, as well as the red circle which was our upper monitoring station for the specific flow releases we monitored and are depicted on the following slide. To explain the effects of EFRs of different magnitude, two pulse flows in 2010 and 2011 were monitored in the river segments of the catchment. And at this stage, John Hinwood and I offered to monitor the estuarine component of the system. The 2010 EFR was designed as an ecological flow to reduce the impacts on the reaches below the dam with some effects down through the catchment, while the 2011 EFR was a larger geomorphic flow designed to scour the upper degraded channels. From the figures on the right of the slide, you can see the effects of the two flows on the salinity distributions in the estuary, immediate post-peak, with the displacement of the salt downstream differing related to the different magnitude of the EFR flows. The figures on the left of the slide show time histories of the salinity at the upper monitoring station. The impact was obviously different for the two flows of different magnitude. In both cases, however, other natural flows have impacted on the salinity patterns, obviously making our job more difficult in extracting data for an empirical evaluation of pulse flows. This slide picks up on the downstream variations in the impact of the 2011 EFR on the salinity distribution with the profiling before, peak and after, illustrating the shock recovery patterns at time snaps during the release. The important thing to realise at this stage is that a purely empirical study is not feasible. 
and that some modeling is required to look at the fundamental processes over a range of different flow magnitudes and durations where we can control the model inputs to exclude interruptions by other natural flows. This uh, would permit examination over a selected range of flows that might be within the budget and limited water resources of the management authority. We used our established model, which has been reported elsewhere and is referenced in the top uh, text on the slide. It is a numerical model, a one dimensional parametric model, uh, and we use that to compute the salinities in the estuary. The model has been verified for the Snowy River estuary and the verification is shown on the right of the slide, uh, giving quite an adequate uh, representation or, of the measured salinity. It's also been applied to several other Victorian New South Wales River estuaries um, with the same sort of success. The model tests we use consisted of establishing salinities under a long sequence of tide and average river flows, and then adding an additional pulse of water to the river flows for several tide cycles. The model scenarios are listed in table one, which is highlighted in the middle of the slide. Each of the four series comprised about 20 model runs uh, using the same pulse volume, but durations ranging from three to 300 semi-diurnal tidal cycles. The base flow that we used for all runs was the dry weather value of 225 megalitres per day. You'll note also that we used two different tidal amplitudes representing, in the case of a 0.6 metres, the open estuary or the open entrance to the estuary and the 0.25 where the entrance was constricted. The principal model outputs were residence time, minimum salinity and duration of lowered salinity. The residence time under steady conditions we used uh, offer Sir Anne Lynch's 1981 equation and the salinity results for the two base flow conditions and for the quasi-steady conditions during pulses of long duration. This next slide uh, illustrates some of the model results. In the upper left of the slide, you can see a plot of one of the pulse examples for pulse one. This one running for only 30 tides. The ambient salinity and tidal variations for each of the stations is shown to the left of the solid black line depicting the pulse. The pulse impacts over time are clearly seen with most variation both tidally and also in magnitude uh, occurring at the middle station. The recovery extends over the 30 tides with, here without uh, reaching ambient salinity levels. Separate runs were made with the same total volume for each pulse, but with varying durations and the tide range selected from the two examples. The top left graph is just an illustration of one of those runs. The bottom left graph summarizes these runs with the x-axis showing pulse duration and the y-axis the minimum salinity observed during or following the pulse. While this graph shows significant variation due to pulse length, it's possible to further examine the results using a scaling technique to systematize the data. From our analyses and confirmed by trial, we've established that the parameter that best collapses the data is what we call the estuary flushing parameter, explained in the next slide. This is a measure of the ratio of the volume of water in the estuary to the inflow from the catchment in a time relative to the flushing time. This slide is included for your future reference and contains on the right hand side of the slide the parameters used for the tide, river and estuary in our modelling. From the listed equations on the left you can see that for the salinity change we have extracted a ratio that forms the estuary flushing parameter which is highlighted in yellow. Scaling techniques are often used via dimensionless equations to generalize problems since uh, dimensional analysis is a, the solution for a particular problem and we're looking for relevant variables to describe the patterns in the data that reveal the characteristics of the system. We found that by using the estuary flushing parameter shown again here at the bottom left of the slide we could collapse the results to illustrate significant relationships. The salinity time results have been systematized then by plotting the non-dimensional salinity change S prime 
as a function of the estuary flushing parameter E, as shown for the three stations along the main snowy channel. The graphs to the right of the slide illustrate this point. For a constant tidal regime, the lines on the plot are independent of the pulse volume. This means that multiple pulse volumes do not need to be modelled for a given tide condition. You will note that the lower station has some divergence between the lines. This is related to the fact that the lower estuary is impacted by tributary flows which complicate the mixing processes from the simple EFR pulse down the main trunk of the estuary. In the full paper we will be discussing this further as well as looking at the numerical range of the E parameter, which appears to have a transition value of less than or greater than one to indicate the relative impact of the fresh pulse or tides on salinity recovery. We have been able to demonstrate that an evaluation of the shock recovery of salinity associated with both EFR and natural flows can be undertaken using the E parameter. To apply this in other systems, it is, however, necessary to run a simple model, as each estuary is unique in its response but the model testing can be reduced by use of the E parameter. The need to include tests for pulse volume is reduced. Thank you.